Welcome to the program. I'm Dennis Acheson, your host, and today's guest is Don Bowser. He runs an organization called Impact, Integrity Management, Promoting Accountability and Transparency. Mr. Bowser will fill us in on his background as we go along, but I thought it would be a great way to introduce you to him by pulling a quote from his Facebook page, and he's paraphrasing Hunter S. Thompson. The consulting business is uglier than most things. It is normally perceived as some kind of cruel and shallow money trench through the heart of development industry. A long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free and good men die like dogs for no good reason. <laughs> so I have to ask, what inspires that paraphrase of Mr. Thompson's? Well, working in international development for you know, the better part of the last 30 years. So, I mean, it is uh, very much a, a money business. And what we've seen across international development now is that a lot of engineering companies have consolidated. So it becomes very much a big, big development business rather than where it was in the 1970s and 80s about trying to help the disadvantaged. So to get us started then, um, you're a maritime person who's traveled all over the world now through work. Yeah, like many Maritimers, we, I, uh, I had a buddy of mine from Dartmouth. Uh, we were working in Mongolia, so our standard line was, this is how far Maritimers have to go to find work, is you got to go to Mongolia, right? So, I mean, the, the, it's the classic case, you know, and I just don't like Fort McMurray, so I'd much rather be doing the international stuff. And that was my background. I did international relations, Sovietology, went off to the Soviet Union when I was at Acadia and then decided to, to sort of stay overseas for the better part of my life. And since about 2006, I came back and I reintegrated into the, back into the Maritimes. So that whole theme of corruption and given today's climate and what has been building since the 80s, actually, there are many video clips you can find now or any kind of Google search you can find. It's like corruption and fraud is the new business model. Um, it must be endless potential for work that way on the assumption that people want to know. Yeah, well, my friends in Ukraine thought that I had developed the, the topic of anti-corruption just so I would have lifetime employment. <laughs> uh, so like many topics, yeah, I mean, having started out as a young program officer at uh, Transparency International in 98, basically, you know, you end up um, doing a very Sisyphus work in which you're trying to trying to get things done. It's very glacial in some cases, and when it's not glacial, then it gets very exciting in terms of, you know, the revolution breaks out or yeah. the coup or whatever. So it's either, you know, incredibly slow-paced work chipping away at the corruption issue or then it becomes very dramatic and you have to do things constantly. And like, for example, when I first landed in Ukraine, it was 24 seven, you know, you'd be on Facebook making corrections to laws uh, until late in the night. Wow. Yeah. How do you know where to start? Well, I mean, usually what I do is I try to look at what are the most vulnerable areas. So uh, it, it, when you look at most countries, you'll see that there are areas where there's resources available. Corruption is a business. It's that simple. So people are going to steal whatever they can to, to make a, a profit off of the government, right? So corruption is the misuse of public resources for private benefit. So wherever there are resources, that's where you're going to see the most endemic corruption. In the case of New Brunswick, it's very simple. It's natural resources like it is in many other resource-driven economies, mm. especially in Africa. Mm. Uh, what surprised me the most is in 2006, I came back from a stint in Afghanistan, and I was... I uh, sitting in my place in, in Albert County, and I started to notice all these trucks go by. And it seemed odd. There was never that much traffic there. You know, it's the backwoods of Albert County. Uh, so when I looked into it, of course, this is when they started, uh, the fracking started. And so I was looking at that, and then there was looking at development of uranium mines. There were drones going overhead that had basically geothermal packages in which they're doing the mapping of the, the ground. And so this is the usual process when they're doing the resource searches, right? So they go through this, and they look where, where they're going to be able to mine and whatever else. But there was no public announcements. Hmm. And that's what shocked me the most, is that anywhere, wherever, Central Asia, Africa, anywhere else, the first step is a company will come in and explain that they're good guys and they're going to share their wealth and they're going to build a school or they're going to build roads or they're going to do something. There wasn't any of that. And in fact, it was a very opaque system where you couldn't find out any information about what actually was going on. 
And so that's what really started me to, to think about what is going on in New Brunswick. You grow up and you know that there's one dominant company that, that dominates everything. But what you don't know is, of course, you know, the, this sort of great resource giveaway hmm. that goes on. And so time after time, when you look at almost every sort of big announcement the province has and you start to dig into it, you find out that there's something fishy, basically, about the model that they have, which is giving away the resources for free. New Brunswick taxpayers left to holding the bag and takes all of the, the, uh, the risk on their side. One of the things that's been striking over the past 30 or 40 years is that... Um Canada and New Brunswick is a smaller example of Canada with the natural resource base driven economy. The assumption or the premise was uh, this will generate wealth. Well, it's now been 40 some odd, 50 some odd years for some across Canada. You could go back 100, 150 years. And it's never generated the wealth it's claimed to generate in terms of the distribution of that wealth. Is it time yet, do you think, to change the model? Well, I mean, the, uh, there's several different models when you look at different jurisdictions, right? The problem, main problem that they have in New Brunswick is that, of course, we don't charge real royalties. So when you look at every economic project that they have on board, mm. the tungsten mine, right? Oh, everything else that's going on, it's, you know, 1%. Uh, the fracking was going to give back to the province maximum 4% after the companies have recovered the costs. Hmm. That's not even going to cover, you know, one kilometer of the roads. After four years of fracking, you don't have anything left. Once a company recovers its costs, right, there's only a very small piece of that would ever go. And this is what I've always been arguing, is that we need to stop this because as great as the environmental risks are, the issue here is that it's going to make New Brunswick poor. So there's no argument to say that it creates jobs. It really doesn't create jobs because you're digging a hole, taking stuff out of the ground. Right? Mm -hmm. And so the basic model that they have is this great resource giveaway. We give away the resources. It's a loss to the province, whether it be trees or natural gas or tungsten mm -hmm. or gold or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a net loss to the province in which there's nothing coming back. So obviously the New Brunswick economic model is not working. Right? You can see that the deficits are constantly increasing. Mm -hmm. right? There's a shrinking resources. And every single one of these projects that the province has gotten involved in has lost money. So at some point, people would say, well, maybe we should stop you know, doing this. The same thing, giving out the corporate welfare, giving out the, any, any tax breaks or anything else to companies doesn't generate anything for the province in the end. It doesn't generate jobs. We're losing jobs still. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Thought crosses my mind. Um, past guests that I've interviewed talked about wanting to help out in third world countries and taking on international law for their training. And all of them at some point turn their eyes back home and recognize there's an awful lot of work to be done back at home. Yep. And so they come back home. Do you fit somewhere in that category? No, but exactly. And so my experience was after, you know, fighting corruption overseas uh, and mostly in, in sort of fragile states, conflict zones. Um, to come back and see what's going on in the province was my motivation for then starting to say, no, we have to do something here. So for the last couple of years, I've done what I can basically while I'm home is to be able to look at what can change. The, the fact is, is that in most third world countries, it's far easier to do that. So I found it far easier to work in Afghanistan where there's a recognition that they have a corruption problem. Okay. There is no mass recognition among the political elites here that there is a problem. They don't see the problem. And so the, the biggest problem is they don't see there's a problem. Yes, and that's that's the, the number one thing. But also, I mean, among the masses as well. Now people have sort of caught on. There's something not quite right. Hmm. right? But when I first started talking that New Brunswick is an oligarchy, People said, you're crazy. What are you talking about? Hmm. I said, no, this is exactly how I started. So how I got into the corruption business is that uh, I did my master's on privatization in Eastern Europe in 95, 96. And I saw how privatization there led to corruption, led to shadow economy, led to corruption. And so that's why I became interested in it. So I followed what had gone on in the privatization process. And the same thing when you come here and you look at the economic model it's just not generating any benefits for the average person. So there must be something else there. 
right? Sadly, in the case of New Brunswick, our politicians are not taking the money and buying, you know, hiding it away in the Cayman Islands. I've done very extensive searches of the Panama Papers. <laughs> There's only a couple of names that constantly show up there. Okay. But it's not basically your average politician. So we said, you know, the, the motto of New Brunswick politicians should be, we will not be undersold. We're giving away these resources. We're giving away the province for nothing. Mm. <coughs> Maybe a um, board membership somewhere down the road. Maybe a job. Mm -hmm. So they'll get a job. They'll get a nice paying job. They might be able to get access to a, to a board position. Some other ministers have to take second jobs, apparently to make ends meet. So they're obviously not getting kickbacks to allow them to enjoy the, the life of, of leisure. Hmm. But there's a failure to recognize that what they're doing is first in conflict of interest. And the second point is that they're giving away the very province which you're supposed to re represent. For some vague idea that they're going to generate some benefit or jobs or something for their constituents. And we just haven't seen that. I've seen it. General public would perceive the ADCON uh, exercise of the past, as well as maybe some stuff around fisheries, because there was a court case four or five years ago around fisheries, and I believe it's the issuing of um, licenses for aquaculture. Um, what we get through our own general media here in New Brunswick um, will make the audience tend to think, oh, that's a sign of corruption. In your lens, is that corruption or is that just mismanagement or the buddy system coming to play as opposed to uh, corruption in the sense that you understand it? Well, in the criminal sense here, in terms of breach of trust, no. You would have a very tough time. ATCON, no. ATCON is just straight up fraud. Okay. Uh, the police have plenty of evidence where they could pursue this as a fraud case. Um, the resources were given away before the bankruptcy uh, was, you know, was in place. And so essentially you have fraud on a massive scale. So it's a classic case of fraud, classic case of conflict of interest for the people that are involved. When I tell people in, in Ukraine or in Afghanistan about the ATCON case, they can't believe it. They just can't believe that stuff like this goes on again. Because they have a different perception of our country, obviously. Yes, and people would just, they wouldn't tolerate it. I mean, how, how does this happen? How has this never led to a criminal prosecution? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Ukraine, this would be, you would have NGOs on the streets and people marching and demanding that people be held accountable. There is no demand for accountability at the moment. Right? There's very few voices out there that would like to see accountability. So uh, in the case of ATCON, where, for example, when the Auditor General produces a great report that clearly outlines what happened, yet no criminal action has taken place. That's very odd. Yep. And I even recall some media coverage of when uh, Premier Brian Glant, who wasn't then Premier, but became leader of the Liberal Party, and a question was asked if he would, um, you know, ask Mr. Graham to resign from from the Liberal Party and if you would follow through on the fines that were recommended. And in both cases, the decision was no, that Mr. Graham could remain in the party and we're not going to levy a fine against him. Yeah, I, I mean, it is absolutely ridiculous that when your father is directly involved in the company and you're the premier hmm. and you say you didn't know that he was involved with the company, so either the Graham fa family values are not very strong hmm or they don't talk to each other. But, I mean, this level of absurdity, again, when you try to explain this to people abroad, they can't believe these kind of things go on in Canada because it, they wouldn't be acceptable in any other jurisdiction. So on that theme, then, of public awareness or public voice, NGOs protesting in the streets, do you think, in general, that we're afraid of challenging authority? Well, I mean, there's a very weak civil society, right? We've seen this in terms of the environmental movement. You have some environmental groups most of them get some sort of level of funding from the province so people know instinctively how far you can go you have a lot of screaming voices on social media which doesn't go anywhere hmm. it's not action it's not concrete so when i started to get involved with the stop spraying uh, movement this was what we saw is that the way that people were acting in the past you know small demonstrations and things like that was not actually hitting home you need large numbers. So we went out to the people who are actually affected by the spraying, which is not environmentalists in Fredericton, which is all the fishermen and the hunters and everybody else who's out there in the province. Mm -hmm. So the average Joe in, in, in New Brunswick does care if it's something that he can relate to and he's going to 
to, to get interested in. What I've seen in terms of the corruption issue, there's very little traction even among the political parties. Yes, they denounce it. So both the People's Alliance and the Greens and I have had discussions in the past and trying to mobilize, but it only goes that far. They know it's a bad thing, but what to do about it? Hmm. Right? The same thing with the Auditor General's report. So I had a conversation with the Auditor General about this saying, the past experience is that as soon as you start to be effective, the government is going to start to push back. So you need to somehow build a social movement which will support your efforts and demand accountability. Hmm. And that's what's missing in the province at the moment is neither the political parties are, are able to, to come up with a comprehensive policy framework to say, this is how we deal with this, right? There needs to be accountability, right? We've seen it in case after case after case here in the province where people get away with stuff and then they're never held accountable. Hmm. So in the end, unless people are going to demand that concrete action happens, like for example, that the Auditor General's office gets further support and is able to actually implement the, the recommendations that they make, or there are more watchdogs. And currently the only anti-corruption NGO that operates in the Maritimes is mine, that's it. I mean, and we of course have zero funding. And as I've always said, I will never be able to get any funding to fight corruption in New Brunswick. Of that, I'm absolutely sure. So it's mm -hmm. dependent on my you know, volunteer activities to do it. And I've teamed up with Joan Baxter. Joan used to be a, uh, she's from Tatamagush and she's a Nova Scotian who was uh, very active in Africa for 30 years with the PBC and and others. And uh, and the same thing with Joan. So when she came back to the Maritime, she saw all the shenanigans. She said, yep, yeah, it looks pretty much like Africa. We have to do something about this, right? So we've been chipping away to do what we can, but Again, uh, there, there isn't that level of civil society. There aren't those voices out there currently what we need. So we need a greater awareness and greater level of engagement. Which we is, do. Yeah. yeah. Well, so you're speaking to different degrees of social change in a way, you know, because then that would trigger the political change that would then shift the balance with how decisions are being made. Um, yeah. But New Brunswick's a province that had 198,000 people that didn't vote last election out of 560 or 540,000 eligible voters. Um, that's a pretty big awakening that needs to happen. Yeah, but people are angry. I mean, the third parties have a chance, definitely. There's an opportunity there for, mm -hmm. for the Greens, for the People's Alliance, for the NDP to say, we have to change the status quo. We don't have the level of maturity of them to be able to generate policies that are able to actually be implemented. So I see this quite often. They say, when a green government is formed or when a people alliance yeah. government is formed, yeah. great, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So there are different ways to make policy. There's different ways to take action. Right. So social movements are as strong as the political parties or they can actually complement what the political parties are doing. And that's the piece that's missing. Right. I, I had a chance to talk to, to, to David back in 2014, um, uh, David Kuhn, and, and I, I said, you know, mobilizing people on the ground is the next step. Small town halls and, and the People's Alliance have tried to do this and the Greens have tried to do this. But you need to really have this mass mobilization like the Anakadish movement mm -hmm. back in the 20s. And so what Moses Cody did is probably the most effective example of saying how we can mobilize people. We tried it with the great resource giveaway. We had no resources ourselves, but Charles Terry and I and Rod Cumberland teamed up and we went around the province and, and opened up a lot of people's eyes. That was step one. Mm -hmm. Now, if Charles gets elected and he's in the legislature, then that will give him a much greater platform to be able to do this. But this is what needs to be done. Much more grassroots movement, mobilizing people, getting them out on the streets. Hmm. Do you have examples of that being successful in other places? Sure. In Ukraine, we had a whole revolution about it. So they chased away the government. The common sort of Russia propaganda is that it was, uh, what happened in Ukraine was a coup d'etat. It wasn't. Students went out on the streets and students got beaten by the police. This mobilized everybody. Hmm. So a critical moment or a precipitating event. Yeah, it was basically what had happened was the, the Ukraine uh, government backed away from a, a free trade deal with the EU. Students went out in the street to protest against this, and they were beaten by the police, and this mobilized everybody. And then you had millions out in the street saying, enough, enough with the corruption, enough with the abuse of authority, enough with the, you know, strongman tactics. Mm -hmm. And basically, after a certain point, the government just gave up. They realized that, and after they had killed, you know, over 100 people. So kids were going out, and they were willing to risk their lives to stand up for social justice. 
uh, we don't want to see that level of sort of anger and everything else, but it would be good to see people mobilized, right? And it's very hard to get New Brunswickers out on the street. I get it. Everybody's working. They're tired after work. Yeah. You know, there's a limited amount of uh, energy that people have yeah. to, to donate towards this stuff. But the reality is that if we want change, people are going to have to mobilize. It doesn't have to be through just through the political parties. There are much greater ways to do this. And some people who have been on the show in the past um, have alluded to the same need for an awakening. But it also tied to, um, as I listened between the lines, it was uh, we're kind of soft. You know, we're, we're, we're comfortable. Um, we don't sense much risk. Our version of risk compared to other countries' version of risk are two radically different things. Um, does it need to get to that point where we're, we're feel risk with our water, we feel risk with our air, we feel risk with our food supply before we finally wake up? Or is there a chance to do it beforehand and actually plan and be prepared? So if climate change kicks California and Texas and the food supply completely shifts, and the three days supply that's in the grocery store is gone within three days. And so can we create a local food economy now so that 20 years from now it's mature enough that we can feed ourselves? Those sorts of, sounds like you're doing doom and gloom in advance because it's not right in front of your face. Or does it need to be right in front of their face before the action kicks in? Well, I see the difference in the last four years. So between 2014 um, and when we started doing the great resource uh, giveaway, and we saw that people did become aware. People are angry now. People are not going to accept it. But is there a critical mass yet? Probably not, right? And the problem has always been is that the argument of those who would like to keep the status quo says, you know, shut your mouth or the jobs get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the so, risk of job loss. So this is always what is used is to say, well, the jobs are, are going to be gone, but their jobs are gone anyways. <laughs> so you know, it's uh, Rod Cumberland had a great thing about about the issue about having the frog in the pot and it's boiling and he doesn't yeah. realize until it's too late. And so the point is, is that if we want to see replications of what happened back in the anti fracking heydays, and you want to see violence done against the government then just continue down the current path that we're on because eventually that anger is going to boil over in one form or another and it mm -hmm. what i've seen in the number of countries in which i've been in the middle of a, the revolution or the, the coup d'etat or whatever else is that it boils up to a certain point and then that's it and that can just be a snap thing are new brunswickers going to grab their guns and go out in the streets probably not mm -hmm. But are they going to get really angry and start, you know, breaking windows at some point? Yeah, it's definitely a possibility. We've seen it in the past. So the social cohesion in the province, and, and I start to see this language being used, is that the government recognizes that they have a problem with social cohesion, hmm. right? Hmm. They recognize that there is an issue now in terms of language where there's a lot of people upset. So how are you going to let the air out of that? Well, of course, what they continually do is do small measures or pretend or they set up a lot of fake sort of activities, right? Yeah, do so, another study. Well, by the time the study's done, your four years have passed and you still haven't implemented anything. So there was a great piece today on CBC about TransAlto. TransAlto was paying scientists in Edmonton to give them the studies. And this is constantly what happens in and you know, you know, in New Brunswick, is that there's always one guy who's willing to write whatever you want, right? So there's a lot of academics and academics who are desperate for funding, who are going to be able to do this. But again, you don't see that level of civil society in which people are demanding facts, demanding accountability, hmm. right? So when I see these glossy reports which have nothing in them, hmm. right? And it was the same thing. There was one that there was actually a very good point made. Uh, by somebody who was talking about the language commissioner's report. He said, great, a lot of facts, none of which are verified by other statistics. Hmm. And that's the kind of questions you need to ask. Hmm. Can this be verified? Okay, you produced a report that says fracking is okay. What is the other sources that you have? Not just you telling me or a guy who pretends to have a science PhD is going to tell me that this is the case, right? Let's, or, you know, you did some red dot survey um, among people that you know and like, right? Let's see some other real hard evidence about this. And so there's definitely a problem in terms of policy and evidence-based policy in the province, right? It just has zero degree of credibility. So when I see all these reports, they just don't stand up. 
And then the reports don't get implemented yeah. uh, for the ones that do stand up. And that's a great frustration, but that takes a certain level of sophistication on the part of the audience to catch that. They need to remember the first poverty study done in the 1980s with Senator Ermine Cohen out of St. John on child poverty in Canada. And to see we're in the exact same place 40 years later, it's... If not worse. Yeah, the, the problem isn't the study. <laughs> the yeah. problem is turning it into action. The... Uh, for directions to go with this, then, so if you've seen it in other countries, and New Brunswick needs a critical mass, um, the provincial narrative is a hurting rig right now, for lack of a better description, which is why I want to do this show, because we have to have a place to tell our stories and be positive. But media has changed a lot the past 10 or 15 years. It's more like infotainment sometimes than, than context and five questions deep and invite the audience into that deeper place. So do you think the message gets lost or diffused because of how our provincial media will portray a story, either working an angle or shrinking it to a soundbite or just ignoring it altogether? Sure. Classic example of this. How many stories have you seen about Dominic LeBlanc? Uh, actually, one. <laughs> yeah. As I prep for this. Yes. <laughs> So the ethics watchdog has flagged that the deal with Elsa Bucto and the surf clams is something that they need to look into. Mm -hmm. Geez, I somehow New Brunswick media has missed that point. Hmm. That's awfully strange, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and is it because they're under-resourced? Is it because decisions are made out of province on them? So Toronto or Halifax will say, in terms of electronic media, will say what you're doing, what you're not doing. Print well, media is another story. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of the in terms of the TV, it's very simple. The ad dollars are the problem. So mm -hmm. I have a good friend who's involved as the sort of local boss of one of the major TV networks, and he always makes that point. Is that right? At the end of the day, it's it's a business, right? Mm -hmm. So the business is driven by ads. So it's going to do, of course, what people want to see. They're not in the business. They, they, they do as much investigative stories as they can. Right? But where is the real um, capacity going to be in terms of doing investigative reports? Well, it's going to be with CBC. But starving CBC of funds means that how much can they do? And, and they're very, of course, open to political pressure because that's just the way that it works. So, you know, CBC does what it can. Mm -hmm. um, but there is very little in terms of, you know, uh, definitely in terms of the television media about how many investigative reports they're going to do because also the same thing, print thing, they'll get sued, right? So they're always very cautious about that. Um, and the problem with the alternative media is like the third parties here, they're just so weak, you know, fact check. If you want to be taken as a credible news source, check your facts. And everybody screams about mainstream media, but I've, you know, worked with some of the biggest media outlets in the world wall street journal new york times whatever and seeing the level of fact checking that they do on every story every single fact has to have at least two sources mm -hmm. all right so that's the level that goes on right they look into what they're going to say and making sure that the facts check out um so if there isn't the capacity in terms of the alternative media uh, then you're going to be stuck with what's coming out of mainstream media, or you're going to be easily manipulated uh, through Russian propaganda, like the Russians. And the Russians, of course, discovered this is the cheapest way to influence things in North America. Yep. For what it costs, basically one rocket, you could uh, completely, you know, take over social media, and you have lots of willing people that are going to go along with it, right? Which gets into the the next phase of things, which is what people choose to believe. And that's fascinating, especially with the experience going on in the United States right now. And that must be an interesting intersection for you, given um, what you call yourself, a Russologist? Or Rus I used to be a Sovietologist. Sovietologist. So nothing has changed since the 1980s. In fact, I've been, I repeatedly put up this YouTube video of a KGB defector who in the 1980s explained how the KGB was operating in terms of putting out this fake news. And so I saw actually somebody uh, in, 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 uh, in sort of an international think tank caught on to this, not through me, but through mm. their own research, and they discovered that, yes, he predicted exactly what was going to happen. So what's going on right now is that the KGB is just using, well, it's now the FSB and the SVA, and they're using exactly the same tactics, right, to make sure that everyone doesn't believe anything. 
Hmm. So mainstream media is bad. So the Alex Jones type attacks on everything, right? If you can't believe mainstream media, who are you going to believe? We have to believe me because I have the insider view. I don't have to check facts. I don't have to prove anything to you, hmm. right? Hmm. So we've entered this new dark age in which reason and evidence are out the window and people just want to believe whatever they want to believe, right? So it's the same thing. People on social media were putting out something about uh, repeating the the Russian propaganda line that uh, it's okay to, for Russia to have meddled in U.S. politics because the U.S. did it before. That was put out by by Russian propaganda over the last couple of months, which is exactly what Trump says. So you have people on the far left basically quoting Alex Jones or quoting basically the same line of argument that Trump has. Hmm. So the far right and the far left have now met in this tinfoil hat. We don't need any evidence. We believe this. We have passion, therefore we're right. And without evidence and without facts, we're doomed, right? If citizens are not going to ask for facts, that's all you have to do. The easiest way to counter the spin out of the government is simply ask, where are the facts? Give us the facts. You put out a report, okay, what other sources do you have that verify these things that you've said? If not, that's an opinion piece. That's not anything scientific. It's just merely your opinion. And so this idea that all you have to, to do is ask for what are the sources, where is the evidence, what are the facts, is probably the best way to counter all this. I mean, my, my big passion is, is, is this, is that why, why people are so passive about this. Right? It's their money. And this is what we've seen, is that the, the line of argument of being a fiscal conservative, right? So this is why the PCs don't come off as being very credible in terms of the conservative part of it, because they really don't demand fiscal conservancy, right? Yeah. right? New Brunswick, as it walks into the next election, which will be in September, we're recording this at the end of July of 2018, um, as they walk into the next election, it seems like there's a bit more awareness that there are five choices as well as independent candidates. It seems like there's a bit more awareness that your legislature can still function even if you have a minority government or even with a majority government but three or four different colors and flavors as part of the dialogue that will go on in that legislature. But the great unknown is still who's paying attention in the general public. And will they surface enough to make that happen? Do you have any thoughts? Because mainstream media will start to ramp up a little bit. And we'll start to ramp up the show a little bit to give access to authentic voice. And you decide for yourself um, what you think for the audience's sake. But 40 years of the two political parties more or less looking the same. Um, one of the languages or storylines is doesn't matter, conservative or liberal. It's the same sort of government. But after 40 years, we're kind of in a bit of a mess, depending on how you want to look at it. It's great potential, but we're still in a bit of a mess in terms of decision-making process. And here go the red jobs, here come the blue jobs. Oh, there go the blue jobs, here come the red jobs. Um, that's not a way to build an economic, economically stable province. And then the related support mechanisms of education, healthcare, environment, all those pieces um, struggle with systemic challenges. The key to the whole thing is voter engagement. Do you have thoughts on how we get there? Well, I'm political science with a couple of... Uh, so as a political scientist with a couple of advanced degrees, I mean, the, the issue that I see is that in order for the third parties to be effective, they need to professionalize. Definitely the Greens have gone a long way in four years in terms of professionalizing, right? But being able to tap into the resources and having political operators out there Right. You just you, you you have sort of this idea that, OK, the rules don't apply to us. We're third parties. Therefore, you know, we're morally right. But morally right is not going to get you elected. Uh, you know, for all his uh, great faults, I, I always uh, see that at least Dominic Cardi understood that you need to have an uh, infrastructure in place in terms of the political party to make things happen. Right? I thought a lot of things he did was misguided. But at the end of the day, you need to have a professional party. You need to have a policy team. There are lots of people out there. There's lots of smart New Brunswickers that are out there you, you can tap into, right? So if you look in, the, in terms of the pools of people that are out there that would be willing to lend a hand or would be good for advice, I don't see this level of, you know, advisory coming in. 
the Greens, when they came in, had a very narrow focus in terms of they wanted to be, you know, just looking at, at, at you know, a couple of issues. But in reality, of course, they are, could be, the voice of all of those disadvantaged rural voices that are out there. Again, if you want to go to the far left, then look into the Antigonish movement, look to Moses Cody, look at the mobilization that was done. By talking to all the little people who are getting trampled by the current system, there are a lot of people out there. And that's, again, you know, this is what we learned when we started the Stop Spraying stuff. We said, okay, let's forget the models of everybody who's been working on environmental issues in New Brunswick. Let's look at the guys who really care. And those are the guys who can't find moose or deer. Those are the guys whose fish is being poisoned. Those are the people that care. Those are the voices of average New Brunswickers. Average New Brunswickers are willing to listen. They're angry. They're fed up. But what they need to have is candidates and a party system that is going to be able to mobilize them. Uh, I see a lot of what happens in New Brunswick politics is basically, my team's the best. Well, why? No, but my team's the best. Great. Uh, so what makes your team the best? No, no, but we're, we're, we're better than those guys. Yeah. Great. So what are you going to do? What concrete policies, you know, that have evidence, that facts, that you're, how are you going to change things? Like in terms of corporate capture. So when I started talking about New Brunswick as an oligarchy in which you have regulatory capture, industries basically write the news. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have industries that write the regulations, right? The whole game in the province is set by industry. The way out of this is to say business does business, and you have a fair market in which nobody has an undue advantage, and the government governs. The New Brunswick government doesn't govern. It reacts. Mm -hmm. It goes here, and it goes there, and it goes everywhere else. But there's really no long-term thought process put into this. There's no real evidence-based policies that are generated saying, what is the way out? It's no, we have to feed the patronage machine. We have to react to the situation. We have to worry about the next election. So how does that pattern get broken? Part of what you say reminds me of a conversation with Peter Linfeld four years ago now, where he was um, speaking on global economy terms and how forestry in New Brunswick more or less is done. But you have to have a 25 or a 30 year mindset to understand what's happening around the world and in our scale. And the questions he wanted to portion that window of time was, what do we need to do today to anticipate that shift that will come within 20 or 25 years? And then politically, what do we need to do? So when you speak to an industrial model of economy that's kind of prescribing what the legislation is going to be, um, and if there's some amongst us with skill sets and experience and knowledge that know that's done, but within 20 years. How do we get at that now rather than wait for the 20 years in the cataclysmic event and 28,000 people sure. are no longer employed in softwood lumber industry? But that's the problem when you have regulatory capture by an industry and they're the ones dictating the regulations. Hmm. This should be done by government. Hmm. So it's that simple. So The that resources belong to all New Brunswickers. Hmm. So at the end of the day, the government should be protecting public interest. This nonsense, for example, we get put in a freedom of information request to ask about the movement of deer, what happens if a deer dies and you know, you're not allowed to move them, because it would, it would hurt a third party's commercial interests. That's nonsense. Public funds are for the public. Hmm. There is no degree of privacy allowed when it's the use of public funds. Neither... Opportunities New Brunswick, nor any other agency using public funds, has a right to claim that they're hiding to protect the interests of a corporation. That's just complete and utter nonsense. So would that tie to the conversation around Meta v. Blue Cross taking yes, over? Yes, all of this. I mean, if it's public funds, then it must be transparent and you must have a public discussion about this. There is no protection of corporate interests with the use of public funds. That doesn't exist anywhere in the world. I've never heard this argument. And when I explain to people when we talk about this, right now Canada is trying to portray itself in terms of the open government movement as one of the most open government places on the planet. Of course, it's a joke. When you, I was part of the open government process. They, it was by invitation only to a couple of select NGOs. And anybody who showed up who uh, was uncomfortable, basically the government would just leave the room. This can't go on. This is the level of Turkmenistan or some authoritarian regime in which they say, no, no, we're going to hide behind 
other people's private interests when it's public funds. So the problem that we have is that you have private interests which dominate all of the public discussions mm -hmm. and all of these public debates that should be going on. That should be done by the government. The government of New Brunswick does not govern. What it does is react or protect private interest. It doesn't government and it doesn't govern in the interest of the New Brunswick people. And this is one thing where New Brunswickers themselves have to say, we don't accept that. We want government to actually go out and govern. We want government to say, here's the interests of New Brunswickers. Here's what we have to do to protect the interests of New Brunswickers. And we no longer accept that you're going to hide behind, mm -hmm. you know, some rule that you just made up yesterday that says, no, we're not allowed to tell you that. Mm -hmm. It's nonsense. Yeah. When Ken McGeorge was on the show, um, speaking to his great passion, which was healthcare, he whittled all of this discussion down, similar to you, to leadership and the need for leadership. Is it possible, from your take, that uh, Ken was speaking about leadership in a political sense, but we also need leadership from citizens' sense? How do we foster those two new versions of leadership so that government now has the environment to govern rather than for your cycles on decision making for the sake of winning seats based on patronage appointments and shuffling money around. Well, I mean, the, this is sort of the key issue is patronage kills. That's just the fact, whether it be in roads or in healthcare or anywhere else, we have a system set up in which you have highly paid administration administering a public health system for basically a medium sized city. 700,000 people is not a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? It's ridiculous, of course, the amount of money that's wasted in terms of the administration. And in the end, what do we get? We get a third world level of health care. The bed source issue is only a minor one. Mm -hmm. What goes on and the fact of the wait times and everything else and the amount of waiting that you have to do. My father just went through this with cancer surgery, went into emergency, was kept there 10 hours waiting while he was bleeding. I mean, this level of health care shocks people. And I've talked to people from abroad, and they said, yeah, once we go into your healthcare system, we can't believe it. We're far better off, you know, flying back to India or going somewhere else or flying to, to Thailand to get treated rather than face treatment here. The reality is, and New Brunswickers have a hard time accepting this, but I can say is that having looked at healthcare systems quite a bit around the world, is that the level of care currently in New Brunswick really is you know, far below what I could expect in Ukraine or what I could expect in Eastern Europe or in most parts of Asia. So that's very contrary to some of the public opinion and to some of the uh, past guests that have been on. So John McGarry was on two years ago talking about regional health care delivery. His sticking point was to try to get New Brunswickers to accept a regional health care delivery model instead of the need for a hospital in every community. Mm -hmm. That belief that you need bricks and mortar to get health care yeah. rather than a more mobile thing. Sure. So sitting and doing the show, it's fascinating the different perspectives on the same thing. Mm -hmm. So your perspective on New Brunswick health care is, is that's like a D or a D minus, and it's not a B plus or an A. Um, other people would have an A experience but you would bring to it a systemic sort of view as well about what probably could be better because you're measuring it against what other jurisdictions do with their health care. But we looked at this because I, I did actually quite a bit of looking at the corruption risk within the healthcare system in Ukraine. So, for example, this polyclinic model of having smaller primary health care, of course, would be one of the answers. Everybody going into the emergency at Moncton is a disaster or Fredericton or whatever else. We've just seen that this is an absolute disaster. There are other ways to deliver. The other side of it, of course, is yes, of course, nurses can deliver it. Now, if I want a prescription, I have to go see my doctor. I was an orphan in New Brunswick for three years. So what do we do to get my prescriptions? Hmm. I have to go overseas, fill my prescriptions and come back because I won't be able to get into see a doctor and he won't be able to prescribe me and mm. you know even basic level of when well, you look at diabetics I'm a diabetic and of course it's shocking that of course people have to buy insulin mm. I mean that just doesn't exist almost every country I know is that that insulin is available for free for for almost everybody who needs it so the problem is yeah there's different ways to do this but the other side of it is medical education right so you look at one of the one of the big issues. How many New Brunswickers uh, can get a, a a doctor's degree here in New Brunswick? Right. So are we actually making those places available? Does Dalhousie train the doctors that even they need in the Maritimes? No, it doesn't. 
So people have to go to the Caribbean, people have to go elsewhere. So one of the easy solutions to this would be to team up with the education system and say, okay, like they did with the, the nursing school, right? So Ol what, what Olton's about? was doing, uh, you know, privatized nursing training, and now at least UNB has stepped in and yeah. in Moncton. Right? And what about UNB St. John with the uh, connection with Dalhousie Medical School? Yeah, uh, well, it's fine. But, of course, you need the places to be yeah. able to, to, to do that. You don't have to say that everybody has to be trained in New Brunswick, but even if they're being trained elsewhere and given yeah. the opportunity to come back. But Canada has a deficit hmm. of training places for doctors. Then we go out to other jurisdictions and recruit people. Well, I can honestly say, in most of the world, it's very easy to buy a doctor's degree. So in most of the developing countries, you simply go and you pay your money and that's it. Even in the Soviet Union, when I landed there in 1990, 91, you were able to go and pay $4,000 and get an MD without ever showing your face inside the, a classroom. Really? Of course, you can buy degrees. And now what we've seen is that these diploma mills, of course, are, are, are working now also in, in terms of North America. So people are able to buy uh, in Pakistan and elsewhere degrees, which are then, you know, go through some sort of verification. But there's a lot of corruption risk in terms of that. Hmm. Yeah. So to make a turn then, because um, it is your work invites us into the shadow side of civil society. Um, and sometimes you've got to go through that shadow world in order to get to the, the joyful stuff on the other side. It's like there's three layers. There's normal surface activity. How are you? I'm fine. Da -da. And then there's what's just behind it in the shadows that tends to really dominate what goes on on the first layer. But if you can get through those two layers on the third layer, um, there's joy, wonder, magic, social cohesion, happiness. If you want to have a happiness index for your province, you need to be able to get through that second layer of corruption or shadow work. So one of the questions I wanted to ask is, is there anything sacred anymore? Because you just described diplomas, um, just pay some sure. money. So there's nothing sacred in some places about that. Um, New Brunswick has its own version of it, like, where's our sacred? We need to get our feet down on something somewhere that we can believe in so that we can push and move forward. Do you have any sense of anything that's sacred in New Brunswick? It's an odd question. No, no, I, I understand where you're going with. Uh, the short version would be no, because I mean, what used to ground everybody? Well, no matter what, we live in a good place with good soil and good water beaches and everything else well you can't go to the beach anymore yeah, not open because, they, because what they've done is allowed unregulated building of cottages which is insufficient so again the government hasn't governed mm -hmm. what the government has done is allow people to have their all their cottages grandfathered in and mm -hmm. allowed all this building to go on and trailer parks to go up and that's it so the one treasure that you had is those Northumberland straight beaches, and this is why I spend almost every day out on the beach. It's just world class. It really is. I mean, people can't believe it. So, you know, I talked to some Swiss. I've talked to some Germans in the last couple of weeks that have been there, even some Russians. And of course, they can't believe it. They say, this is like something, you know, we would pay big, serious money <laughs> to go to be able to swim. You know, yeah. this is the level of Florida in terms of yep. what you actually have as a treasure. What have we done? Well, because, buddy, my, my cousin wants to build a cottage, and so that's fine. I'll allow him to do it, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and that's it. So you have allowed, basically, us to spoil it. The same thing when you drive across a province, it looks great, lots of trees, right? Until you go off the highway for five meters and you find out, no, it's a, another clear cut. Yeah. So the very thing which would be the driver of this, to bring in knowledge workers who want to live in a nice place. Well, what happens? Knowledge workers come and then they realize, no, okay, well, there's a pulp plant next door and that's going to spoil that. Oh, there's a clear cut next to me and so that's that. Mm -hmm. So the thing that really... The Brunswick has to offer currently in the world economy is a nice, safe place with nice nature to be able to do this. And when people come and they realize, no, it doesn't even have that, then what else do you have? So the one sacred part which we had, which was nature, uh, is also going to be gone soon. So the current model that we have of strip everything out of the ground, allow anybody to do whatever they want, hmm. is simply going to ruin the one thing that actually would be a real generator of wealth and growth and happiness and all of those other things. Hmm. Right? This might sound a little odd, but to me it wants to connect. Do you believe First Nations 
would help us through that? Uh, well, again, do they have the level of governance and, and evidence-based policy that would be able to do that? So what we see is that, of course, because you know, they have relatively weak governance structures across. They have traditional governance, mm -hmm. which is good. But when it meets up with the modern world, then that's a problem where traditional governance, and this is the same thing that's happened in other, uh, in other places where you have traditional governance. Traditional governance doesn't fit that well in terms of administering natural mm -hmm. resources with large corporations, right? So what we've seen is that, yes, it would be great, but can they, do they have the capacity themselves to be able to actually administer this, right? This is an administrative question. That's it. So what we're going to see with, for example, the current investigation against Dominic LeBlanc in terms of the surf clam mm -hmm. uh, quota that's been given out, is that going to be effectively administered? I don't know. Hmm. And the fact is, if corporations can run circles around the government of New Brunswick or the government of Nova Scotia on these issues, right? Is, are they going to be able to do that? So morally is a great thing, and it's the same thing with the third parties. They morally feel that they're right. That's great. But it comes down to administration. Hmm. Somebody's got to do the paperwork. Somebody's got to manage the thing. It's, it's all very mundane. And in fact, most of the countries where I've seen, government fails for exactly that reason, because they can't do the administrative work. They can't just have a professionalization. They're not able to actually do this stuff. Um, which is mundane, like accounting and everything else, right? Hmm. So uh, you see in the Auditor General's reports, you can see it as incompetency, or you can see it as some evil manipulation. My experience in the corruption business is that most of the times it's a mixture of both. Uh, quite often it's just incompetency, and the level of stupidity can never be underestimated, right? So the problem that we have is that and, and again, when we, Charles Terrio and I started to look at the Great Resource Giveaway, we realized that most of these characters who were involved in this felt bad. They felt bad that they gave away the wealth of the province. Mm -hmm. So when they start to get older, then they start to think about, why did I do that? What, you know, what did I get out of it? Mm -hmm. So, of course, there was this recognition that, you know, they gave away the goodies, they, nothing really came back, and nothing came back to the province. So they have a guilty conscience. So what we've seen in case after case is people involved in terms of the natural resources side eventually get a, a bad conscience about some of these things, and they're willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And they're some of the most credible sources because they know what happens. So that's one of the big issues is that, of course, the administrators anywhere, whether it be First Nations or it's going to be the government in New Brunswick, have to do their job. They have to be effective administrators. And to do that, you need a, pro a level of professionalization. If you give jobs to your cousins and your buddies and everything else, you're not going to get that level of professionalization. And that's what we see in New Brunswick, is the level of professionalization across the government is fairly low. That's why they fall for all of these scams and get-rich-quick schemes. I call it the scratchy economy. If only, you know, we're going to win this time, we're going to win the lotto, and that's it. Every All of our problems are going to be solved. Yeah. yeah. Final thoughts to close this out? No, I just really would hope that in this election that things would change and that we would see a couple more representatives in, in the legislature from the third parties who would be able to hold the government accountable. My greatest fear at the moment is that people aren't thinking about that. They're thinking about getting in, but the ways to hold the government accountable and that people would be mobilized to hold the government accountable aren't yet in place. And so if we can somehow, you know, get people in the legislature that are willing to hold the government accountable and demand, right? So when uh, a member of a crown corporation comes before you and says, no, no, I'm not going to tell you how many jobs I've created, then people would say, no, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. That is not acceptable in any legislature in the world. Therefore, we're not going to allow this to pass and that people would start to hold everybody in the province accountable for what's going on. If that doesn't happen, that's it. New Brunswick is bankrupt. And it will be the first province to be officially declared bankrupt. And then what? We become a protectorate. Uh, we lose our provincial status. Uh, you know, we become a territory, right? So I mean, there are a lot of very serious issues. And it's I just I mean, New Brunswick is a place that I feel extremely passionate about. My family's been here since 1772. We feel very connected. When I drive across, you know, the 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 Shenecto Isthmus, and I tell my son, "There's the bridge that your great great grandfather built." You know, there's lots of us Bowsers up in the up in uh, all along here in the graveyards. 
that's a very strong connection. And so it's very sad to see the state that Brunswick is in now. Thank you for this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for watching. If you like the work we do, please support the show and share the show. Offer a comment or two. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.